BBC World News, the biggest African and international news stories. Focus on Africa. This is Focus on Africa from the BBC studios in Nairobi with me, Sophie Ikenya and Peter Okoche. All this week we've been broadcasting from the continent to mark our 10th anniversary, which is tomorrow. Coming up on today's programme... A funeral service has been held for the victims of an attack by gunmen on a church in southwest Nigeria two weeks ago. How artificial intelligence and robotics are slowly transforming the future of medicine. Just how easy is moving to live in a country where you weren't born or raised? We'll check in with Ghana's returning diaspora. And as we mark the 10th anniversary of Focus on Africa, we remember the man who did the first broadcast. Indeed, our dear colleague and friend, Komla Dumont. We have never before seen footage of him to bring to you. Thanks for joining us here on Focus on Africa. It's a solemn day today in southwest Nigeria as the funeral for the victims of an attack by gunmen on a church two weeks ago took place in the town of Owo in Ondo State. Forty people, including women and children, were shot dead by the attackers during mass at the Catholic Church. Our top government officials joined families of the deceased at, uh, at a mass following the service. Families of the victims took the remains of their loved ones for private burials in the town. Now, this attack is the latest of security challenges that plague the length and breadth of Nigeria. Well, the BBC's Roda Odiambu has more from Lagos. One by one, worshippers of St. Francis Xavier Catholic Church helped families who lost their loved ones in the deadly attack nearly two weeks ago to move caskets from different houses to a nearby hall where the church was conducting a funeral service. The hall was packed with friends, families and survivors of the attack who have been scarred for life both emotionally and physically. Some of them were lucky enough to bury their loved ones after the funeral service, but others were not. After everything, I will carry my wife back to the mortuary there. You will stay there tomorrow. We convene to my hometown, Ebony State, because after everything, we cannot go today again because of the time and the how Nigeria be now. So we don't want to move in the night. The government believes the Islamic State West Africa province is responsible for the attack, but they haven't claimed responsibility. Different security experts that the BBC has talked to say they do not believe that the Islamic State is responsible for this attack as this is not how they would operate. If they were responsible, they would be the first one to come out and claim responsibility. But as life slowly goes back to normal in Owo, not only are the people in that part of the country calling on the government to beef up security, but everyone in Nigeria is asking the government to increase resources put towards the security sector such that police officers are deployed in areas where rampant attacks would happen as the country is battling kidnappings, banditry and even the jihadist insurgency in the northeastern part of the country. Rodo Diambo, BBC News, Lagos, Nigeria. Well, I'm now joined by Kabiru Adamu, a security analyst for Abuja, to get more on this story. Kabiru, I mean, this is almost an incessant problem that the Nigerian, uh, that Nigeria is facing as a country. First of all, what do you make about the disparities in the number of people that have been confirmed dead? The government says it's just over 20. The church says it's more, it's over 40. Well, unfortunately, um, this is quite common in Nigeria where you have um, this type of disparity between uh, figures provided by government departments and then figures provided by uh, persons who were affected or residents of that location. And it speaks of the huge distrust that exists between government and, and, and citizens and, and residents. In this instance, 
Um, there has been over the period since the incident happened conflicting information, both from the side of the government and then from the side of um, the, the, the residents. Unfortunately, um, there hasn't been any verification as it were. Even during the funeral, the questions have arisen as to you know the, the, the uh, names, the identity, and as well as uh, those that were involved in, in the incident. More importantly, the perpetrators have not been arrested. To I, I, and I was just going to mention the perpetrators because two weeks on, we still don't know who carried out this attack. Exactly, and, and this, this, is, this speaks squarely uh, on to the fact that the Nigerian criminal justice system is one of the main drivers of insecurity in the country. Uh, it, it's failing um, to arrest, it's failing to punish perpetrators of um, various offenses in the country. Mm. Now, uh, a few days ago, on June the 12th, this was Democracy Day in Nigeria, President Buhari addressed the nation and said security agencies are getting on top of the insecurity situation in Nigeria. I mean, should that be believed, given the spate of insecurity across the country? Um, to be fair to the Buhari administration, um, this is something it inherited. And it has made some attempts in to solve some of the especially underlying issues that allow in insecurity to fester. So it had looked, looked at the law, laws creating some of the government departments, in particular the police. It has reviewed and passed the new police act, which is quite important. It has attempted to improve the human rights uh, as well as the rules of engagement of the police, quite commendable in that regard. It has also promised that it would, uh, the operational requirements of the security departments, including setting up evidence rooms. Unfortunately, there, it, it, not much has been done in that regard. The issue of cooperation between the various security departments that has been flagged as one of the major reasons behind the ineffectiveness of these organizations, we haven't seen much in, in that regard. And then the, for me, the biggest one is the lack of accountability within the security sector. Okay. We haven't uh, seen Kameri, much. If I, let me just cut you because we're running out of time. And I've got a very brief question, if you can answer it very briefly. Is it time for Nigeria to call on the international community to come and help it combat this wave, this growing wave of insecurity? As far as I know, um, the international community is helping Nigeria. UK, as an example, has a, almost a permanent office between the Ministry of Defense, Defense the, the BMAT, the British Military Assistance, um, whatever, to Nigeria. The US, too, has the same thing. And if you look at the intelligence um, you know, se sector, there is a lot of liaison between Nigeria and um, almost all the Western countries, as well as with other countries of the world. So I, I don't think it's really about calling the international partners, rather, how would the point I was making earlier around accountability, how, okay. how Nigeria improved that so that its security sector um, okay. agents held accountable for their actions? Kabiru, thank inaction. you very much for joining us here. Kabiru Adamo, security analyst, speaking to me live there from Abuja. Let's broaden this out now to the security situation across the continent. Sophie? Thank you, Peter. In the 10 years that Focus on Africa has been on air, we've covered conflicts on the continent extensively. Today, there are still conflicts causing untold sorrow and devastation for millions of civilians caught between warring groups. Now, the major flashpoints have been in the Sahel region. A decade of conflict has forced more than 2.5 million people to flee their homes. In Burkina Faso alone, the total number of IDPs rose to more than 1.5 million by the end of 2021. Six in ten of the Sahel's IDPs are Burkinabe. Now, in the last decade, the Democratic Republic of Congo has known little peace. The country has 5.6 million internally displaced people the most in Africa, according to UN figures. Now, there are at least 1.9 million in North Kivu. That's the province where the current fighting is taking place. Eastern Dia Congo has experienced near constant conflict since 1996. Well, in the past decade, Somalia and Kenya have both been affected by attacks of the uh, terror group Al-Shabaab. And this is because events taking place in Somalia have spilled over into the neighbor, into neighboring Kenya after the country's defense forces intervened and sent troops to Somalia in 2011. Next door, the civil war in Ethiopia between a federal government and the rebel group Tigrinya People's Liberation Front has left around 4.2 million people displaced. Most are in need of food aid and hundreds, thousands, hundreds of thousands more uh, face famine-like conditions. And 
in Mozambique, the Islamist militant group Al-Shabaab, affiliated to Islamic State, has waged a campaign of terror in the northern part of the country. Over 735,000 people have fled their homes uh, since the conflict in Cabo Delgado started in October 2017. Well, let's explore this a little further. And I'm joined by Beverly Ocheng from uh, BBC Monitoring. Beverly, uh, thanks for taking time to speak to us. Uh, what has made these regions so vulnerable to conflict? I mean, you can see that there's a common thread with why there's political and social upheaval in some of these places and how insurgent groups capitalize on political and social disgruntlement to continue thriving. In the Sahel, we saw in Mali in 2012, a rebel insurgency has quickly spilled over into neighboring countries and it's threatening the Gulf of Guinea. So attacks in Benin and Togo are becoming a frequency. In Somalia, what began as an Al-Shabaab insurgency is now spreading outwards so that the central and southern regions are becoming a launching pad for attacks in Kenya. And even in Ethiopia, what is a political dispute between the government of Prime Minister Abiy and the TPLF in the north has become an armed confrontation and nearly two year long civil war. Mm. DR Congo M23 is back in the scene because it has not been integrated in the army. So we are seeing that there is a level of upheaval that groups are taking advantage of. I'm just wondering what has been done or what is being done now, Bivli? In many countries, there are militaries that have been deployed. So countries like Nigeria, Somalia, Mali are very heavily militarized in response to these insurgent groups. And we're seeing support from regional countries because there is a recognition that implicitly this violence is an existential threat to neighboring countries. So the AU mission, which is in Somalia from neighboring countries like Uganda, Kenya, or Burundi. Mm -hmm. In Mozambique, we have SAMIM, which is Southern African deployment into the northern part of Cabo Delgado. Mm -hmm. And we're seeing in DR Congo, the East African community is actually willing to put in forces to quell the rebellion that's been decades long for now. But I'm just curious, Beverly, uh, whether conflict resolution is evolving at all uh, during this period. Well, there have been some political overtures for dialogue. So Kenya, in addition to deploying the East African forces, is hosting talks between rebels and the DR Congolese government. This is not the first time it's doing so. And in the Sahel, there are some efforts to talk to jihadist groups. But there are questions about where is the room for reconciliation and where is the room for retribution for communities that have long suffered violence and where there is no sense of restitution for them. All right. Beverly Ching, thank you very much indeed for that insight. Thank you. Thank you. This is a focus on Africa from the BBC studios in Nairobi. Join us again after this short break. I've reported for the BBC for around 30 years, looking at global disease threats and innovations in medicine. These girls are benefiting from a vaccine which is offered routinely in wealthier countries. I first became aware of this new coronavirus in early 2020. This has been such a fast moving story and was relentless. The NHS is now on the brink. There's been a wealth of information, and it's my role as medical editor to put that clearly and succinctly for the audience. It is hard to overstate just how important this vaccine could be. It was a privilege to be able to film the very first volunteers to receive one of the vaccines during the trials. It is science we have to thank for giving us this route out of the pandemic. Coronavirus is going to be with us for years to come. We're going to have to learn to live with it, but we'll not see our lives dominated by it. How worried is the WHO? We really need to focus on bringing transmission down. You've been in office for some time. What are you doing about it? This question is without context. What the turnout was, it was over 70%. You know how many seats your party got? Zero, Mrs. We failed to win seats, but we got more votes than previous elections. It's a risk you're taking. I take risks every day. The reason you haven't divorced is that you simply can't afford it. You're right about that. <laughs> Hard Talk, this week on BBC World News. Welcome back to Focus on Africa from BBC World News coming from Nairobi. Let's turn to technology on the continent, or continent now. And while artificial intelligence and robotics may be considered the future of medicine, for a few South African hospitals, the future is now. Well, Cape Town's uh, Tigerberg Hospital is proving to be a hotbed of innovation. Robots are already being used in surgery as well as helping patients connect with loved ones. The BBC's woman Mkise visited the hospital to find out how AI is transforming lives. This is the most advanced surgical robot on the continent. 
there are only three of these machines in the whole of Africa. Tiny instruments mimic the surgeon's hands with great precision and a wider range of motion than a human could ever manage. This is the cutting edge of medical technology in South Africa. Now these surgeons behind me are using the Da Vinci surgical system in order to do a prostate operation on this patient. Now the system has very nimble, sensitive arms which can get to parts of the body which are difficult for surgeons to ordinarily reach. This patient is expected to go home in a day after a three hour minimally invasive surgery. Faster recovery time is one of the major health benefits of this robot. So it's helped us change to more precise surgery. It's the outcomes for patients when you come to quality of life and their longevity is much, much better. So yes, we can take out the cancer with a big open cut, lots of blood loss versus if you do it with these robots, the cancer will come up, but how the rest of your life will be is so much better because we've been able to see nerves that previously we just could not see. Um, and operate much more precisely, so there's way less blood loss, people are out of hospital much quicker. The use of robots is not only limited to surgery, it's also used in improving the mental health of patients that have been in hospital for a long time. Juanita Solomons hasn't seen her family in two months. She uses robot Kanya to talk with her loved ones. Initially developed for COVID patients, Kanya has been repurposed for use in various hospital wards. I think a video call is so much more powerful. And in South Africa, where a lot of patients are far from home, uh, families aren't able to come in to visit, it really helps create that connection. Sure. And, you know, technology has allowed us to do that, which is amazing. And I think it's one of the good things that come out of, come out of COVID. I would never have done this before, mm. but we were forced to do it, and now we're able to take that technology into our spaces going forward. Research in the use of artificial intelligence in medicine is thriving in South Africa at the moment. An app that can identify TB is currently in the testing phase and could be a game changer in the fight against the disease once it launches next year. Vumani Mkise, BBC News, Cape Town. Now, Ghana's government declared 2019 the year of return to mark 400 years since the first African slaves arrived in America. It was also to encourage Africans in the diaspora to return home. And many did indeed respond to that call and relocated to Ghana. Following that, over 100 African Americans and Afro-Caribbeans were granted Ghanaian citizenship. But just how easy is it to integrate into a country where you were not born or raised? BBC's Thomas Nadi reports. These are African Americans and Afro Caribbeans receiving Ghanaian citizenship in 2019, the country's year of return. Some had lived in Ghana for some time, while others relocated the same year. You with me on that? Yes, sir. All right. What's command? Robert Box, an ex Marine Corps in the U.S. Army and now a security manager, relocated to Ghana in 2012. He took advantage of the 2019 campaign and received Ghanaian citizenship. Basically, expectations is the major challenge here. When you expect things to be this way or they to move at this speed, you just have to get used to the speed of the country. You can't come here thinking that we're just like where you come from. You have to adapt and you have to become Ghanaian. During the height of the global pandemic, Ghana closed its air and land borders to human traffic and that had a significant impact on the Year of Return initiative. The Ghana Tourism Authority estimates that the country experienced about a 70% drop in tourist arrivals. Value lost in terms of uh, economic activity in the sector was almost $2 billion. Uh, we had ended the year with about $3.3 billion spent uh, across various tourism sites and activities and hotels and events. Uh, but in 2020, this dropped significantly to about 1.3. What we've seen, which is very positive, is how quickly we've been able to rebound after uh, COVID-19 and the closures and the lockdowns. The majority of dungeons that were used for the slave trade in West Africa were built in Ghana. But about 18 kilometers from the Cape Coast slave castle, a new settlement for African diasporans is emerging. The village is reserved for people of African descent willing to relocate to Ghana. 
5,000 acres of land have been made available by the chief of Asiebu for the Pan-African Village Initiative and is to encourage Africans in the diaspora to relocate to Ghana. 500 of them have already acquired the land and have started building their homes. And the land is offered to them for free, except for administrative charges. Stephen Cochlin II is one of the few who have already settled here in March this year. 80% of the people that try this move, that's my age, go back. They don't make it. And the biggest reason is because they don't find sustainability. They can't sustain while they're in Ghana because you're not a citizen at the time. It's, not, it's a lack of jobs. So you have to figure out what you're going to do to maintain, no matter how much money you come with. And so I want to build a project, a setting, where people find their purpose and figure out a way what they love to do and how to make money doing it. What you do? The year of return attracted a lot of tourists. So the government launched the Beyond the Return Initiative to promote investment. The country is also working on a new law that will make it easier for Africa's diaspora to acquire visas and citizenship. The question now remains if people will take advantage of it and move to Ghana. Thomas Snadi, BBC News, Accra. Now, we have some breaking news in the world of sports to bring to you today. My colleague Celestine Karone from BBC Africa Sports joins us. Tell us. Well, the speculation around Sadio Mane is over. We now know that he is leaving Liverpool. He is moving to Bayern Munich, ending weeks of speculation. He's moving for a three-year deal to the German champions for around $42 million. And now he's been at Liverpool, uh, Liverpool sorry, for six years. And the, some of the accolades he won include a Champions League, UEFA Champions League, and, you know, that uh, helping Liverpool end that 30-year wait for the English Premier League. But this year has really been impressive for him, Peter, because many get the sense that he came out of Mohamed Salah's shadow, you know, because uh, the Egyptian has been the goal-scoring at Liverpool, but uh, with Senegal, he won. Uh, Sadio Mane won the Africa Cup of Nations for the first time. Helped them qualify for the World Cup. Both of these times at Egypt's expense. So he's he's going to go to Bayern Munich, you know, on the back of a very confident season. And he's expected to fill Robert Lewandowski's uh, shoes, and those are going to be some uh, no, big scoring big, shoes to fill. Big shoes indeed. And twenty, but twenty-three goals in all competitions this season. You expect he's going to do well. Celestine Caroni, thank you very much. Thank you. Now, the first presenter of Focus on Africa 10 years ago was Komla Dumont, a brilliant and inspiring Ghanaian journalist who was passionate about Africa. Now, uh, sadly, Komla passed away eight years ago at uh, the height of his career. Let's uh, remind you of this great son of Africa. What? <laughs> Hello, Africa. <laughs> the first night was really exciting we knew we were creating something special this is focus on africa from the bbc with me komla dumont coming up leaders the nerves that day were unbelievable apart from the one person who was just calm as anything and that was komla welcome to the very first edition of focus on africa from the bbc Leaders of the world's biggest economy. When the first show went out, and we really wanted it to be serious. What plans the South Sudanese government has for the resettlement of these people? Some really top interviews and a bit of fun as well. And we came off air and within seconds, all of our phones were going crazy with people saying, that was amazing. And you know what? I do work for the BBC, but it's time for me to show my true colors. I first met Skomla in Ghana, uh, in Accra, during the 50th celebration of Ghana's independence from Britain. Komla was a rising star before he even came to the BBC. And if the BBC did anything in his bigger global community, it was that we amplified his voice and strengthened his presence. But Komla was Komla to the end. How's that look? No? And on Tuesday, full coverage from the palace to the church to the streets of Amsterdam. When I watch Focus on Africa now, from 10 years on, I can still see Komla's stump all over it. Just the integrity, the depth of knowledge, the quest to just really get to the truth and tell the truth, that to me is Focus on Africa and Komla. 
congratulations and happy anniversary to Focus on Africa uh, television. But now we've got to fight for every viewer and every listener. We've got to prove that people will still pick up the phone or answer the phone, open the door, open their hearts when BBC Focus on Africa comes calling. Unfortunately, they still do. So keep going, Focus on Africa. See you same time tomorrow. Kamala Dumont, who launched Focus on Africa 10 years ago. We still miss him every single day. Indeed. Big heart. Big, big smile. The man with the bear hug, eh? And a big voice, too, really. And love Indeed. for Africa, obviously. You what know? a great guy. What a yeah. Great guy. No. Well, you know, that brings us to the end of this uh, special week of, of programs from the continent. But before we go, we have some special people to mention, really. Yes, Sophia and I want to thank all the technical people here in Nairobi, Abuja and Lagos who have made our programs happen this week. There are too many of them to mention by name, but every one of them has shown us this week how dedicated they are to bring the news from Africa to you at home. Our colleagues are a testament to the skills and talent that we have here on the continent. Together we aspire to continue to bring you balanced reporting, not only from Africa, but from across the world. That's it from all of us. Thanks for watching. Thank Goodbye. you for watching. Bye-bye.